Okay. All right, class, time to begin. Uh, I see that uh, the crowd is, is thinning a bit. I don't know if this is the middle of the semester sort of thing or I don't know. Anyway, um, let's get going. Few things that are on your plate. Uh, there's a homework that, uh, that's been out there for almost two weeks now. It's due Thursday. Um, and uh, it involves linear classifiers, mistake bound, and uh, you implement the perceptron and everything. Well, you know, like a bunch of experiments around it. Um, if you haven't started yet, I recommend starting sooner rather than later. Um, it may not take as much time as your first homework, but it still probably will take time uh, because the experiment takes, you know, they, you might find some bugs or maybe you have a slow computer or maybe you're running it on a slow machine or I don't know. Uh, just start soon, get it done sooner rather than later. Please take advantage of office hours and canvas for uh, any questions or if you have any questions now, we can quit any quick questions, we can talk about that. Yeah. Why is initializing weights and non-zero values to change the clock hours? What do you mean by that? Um, you're saying it's time to add initially the weights and then bias, not the all zeros, uh -huh. but add plus or minus by 0 and 1. Oh, right, 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 right. So why does it change uh, uh, anything? Why do different learning rates? That's easy. That's uh, actually kind of easy to see. So let me explain. Um, imagine that. Uh, your, your perceptron is initialized to the zero vector like we usually have. And uh, I'm just gonna show one loop over the data. So for uh, X comma Y in, by the way, I just noticed I use in the set contained notation to say in the data set, uh, that's just me being lazy. So I'll just in the data, if Y W transpose X, is less than zero, W is, okay. Now, if you look at this code, let's say that uh, you iterate through this a few times. Can you say anything about what the W will look like after, after, a bunch, after let's say one update? After one update, your W will be, uh, let's call it the W naught, is the zero vector. And let's say one update happens on ex example x1, so your w1 will be what? y1 x1, because zero plus r1 times y1 x1, right? And w2 will be r times y, y1 x1 plus r times y2 x2, right? So let's say you do this a hundred times. What will your W look like? Just follow this iteration. R times Y. So it, it's something that looks like sum over R Y I X I. Let me pull out the R where I is in mistakes. For every time you make a mistake, you add um, yi xi to that particular weight vector. Importantly, r is a positive number, right? Now let's say, let's consider, let's make this a little smaller because First things first, is this sort of analysis, uh, does it make sense? I mean, um, does that make sense? I mean, at the end of a bunch of updates, your weight vector will look like R times the sum of Y, I, X, I, because at every step you're adding R, Y, X to the weight vector, right? Now, let's consider two cases. Case one is R equals say two, then your W, let's say you have only 100 updates always. So your W 100, or let's call that the final weight vector is W is two times 
And let's, what would your prediction look like? Your prediction is on, on a new example. On a new example, your prediction is W transpose X, the sign of that, right? Is the sign of two times But the sign doesn't change because of the number two. Multiplying by two or multiplying by four or multiplying by 4,000 or 17 does not change the sign because it's a positive number. As long as that R is a positive number, the sign is going to be the same. So you might as well just drop the two. It could be two, it could be 200. So if you had done this with a learning rate of uh, R equals 200, your final weight will be 200 and your prediction will be the sign of 200 times that quantity transpose x. But that's exactly the same as the sign of that quantity transpose x. So if your initial weights are the zero vector, the learning rate does not matter because you'll get essentially the same prediction load. You'll get different weights at the end because you're scaling up and down by the learning rate. But you'll get the same prediction rule because the final prediction depends only on the magnitude, sorry, on the sign and not the magnitude. Does this answer your question? I could still tell how like, tweaking the weights changes. How tweaking the weight changes what? Um, this end of it. Tweaking what weights? So changing the weights, the, the initial weights not be zero. Well, you, you'll end up getting some uh, instead of zero, you'll get some random vector. Let's call that A. Let's put a, let's use a different color for that. You'll get an A and you'll carry around that A everywhere. So you can't, it's, it's A plus that quantity. So you can't pull out the A anymore, so the two anymore. Has this answered your question or has this confused you more? Confused. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense, but now we have a learning rate. Ah, that's, uh, uh, that's a good uh, follow-up question. Why bother having a learning rate? Why did I just add a new extra, this extra notation and make life more complicated for you? Two reasons. The first one is, uh, uh, imagine that your learning rate is really large. And instead of asking you to stop at 20 epochs, I ask you to stop till your error goes below some threshold. So for one learning rate, you might stop in five epochs. In a different learning rate, you might stop at 500 epochs. So then your final weights are no longer going to be the same. Okay, so that, that's the first reason. Second reason is there are other algorithms, including something we'll see today, where the learning rate is not going to be a constant. This You can pull out this two, or this R from here, only because R is a constant. Now imagine that R had a subscript I here. You can no longer pull that out, that the summation is over I. You can no longer pull it out because every R is a different thing. And so most modern learning algorithms have this sort of a learning rate where the learning rate changes as you see more examples. And the intuition there is in the beginning, you want a large learning rate because the model knows nothing. So the first examples allow it to kind of quickly get to a reasonable hypothesis. As it sees more and more examples, you don't want it to keep changing its hypothesis. You want it to kind of refine it, make smaller and smaller refinements. And so the step size keeps going down. What I just gave is an intuition for why uh, something called stochastic gradient descent converges. Uh, did you have a question? Same question, okay. Um, other questions or? If this discussion confused you, I want you to go back to the video and kind of convince yourself that I'm not lying to you. Other questions about homeworks? Yeah. What is AI and AJ? I, I don't. I, in perceptron? Okay. 
Is this question two? What really multiple questions have that? This is a mistake bound block, right? Okay, okay. So that yeah, okay. So the the question is if so the function uh, was something like f of a comma b of x is plus one if is this you're, you're asking about this question right minus one or zero i can't remember else okay now what's the question ah so should you consider a and b are always so the question was can we assume that a and b are always different um i i had people asking me something like this in the office hours also and my answer is uh, the following um, i'm trying to see if i can be consistent with what i said before i only care about the big o notation of your answer yeah and uh, if your answer is correct in big o i'm fine now to prove it you can make your assumptions as you want does that uh, i'm not giving away the answer but i hope i gave you a big hint Uh, this is one of those questions where after you see the answer, I'm like, why does this have so many points? And uh, so it's an easy question once you solve it, but that's true for everything, I guess. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. So uh, this, the, the the class that the system, the uh, the classes, uh, and, and I'm confused where what the n is referring to when there's just x a and x b. N is, I think, the dimensionality. Is that right? I can't. Uh, yeah. Is the number of what features the of, what? of the of the inputs? So what, what what is x a and x b? X sub a is the eighth dimension. Oh, I see. Um, this is the you have an, a vector. This is a vector x mm -hmm. that has n elements. And x a is one of these elements, which is the eighth element, and the bth element is x b. Yeah. I thought I mentioned this. Did I not somewhere? Maybe I. No, I don't know. I uh, I probably did. If not, this is what it is. I did. Okay, he says I did. So. Okay. Other questions? Uh, going back to the announcement, there's also this project milestone that's due uh, that's on Thursday. Uh, I saw that many of you have already done it. Um, and some there was some discussion on Canvas about uh, having trouble signing up to Kaggle using the U Utah U-mail or something. Have those issues been resolved? No? I tried That's irritating. Um, so I'm going to give the same suggestion that was given on Canvas. If you can use a different email address, that would be good. Um, I don't know why email is blocking messages from Kaggle. It's not like Kaggle sends out spam regularly. Uh, or maybe it does. I hope not. Um, if you are not comfortable using a personal email address for this, let me know and I'll figure something out, I'll go bother the email people. Um, and if it, it, it does that uh, does that work? If, if try using a personal email address, apparently that works. And if you really, really don't want to use a personal email address, come talk to me. Any other uh, questions, comments involving the homework, involving project? And by the way, you can start working on the project. At this point, uh, the projects, it's open season on the project. You can start uh, doing things, uh, you know, see if you can, there is going to be another milestone, right? I think a week or two after spring break, maybe, where you have to upload one plus the, the predictions of one of your models. Um, and, uh, you know, you can start playing with that. And we have, we have pre-processed the data less than we might have for the homework. So what we, we've not given you like five fold cross validation splits and all that. So you can set up your own whatever works for you. I would encourage 
you to use the code for your homeworks on your project just because you've already written the code, might as well just get it done. All right. Any any thoughts, any questions about any of these things? Also on uh, Zoom. If not, we're going to move to a new topic today. Today's lecture is about least mean square regression. And uh, it's a bit of a, a, a switch in uh, what we are doing. So far, we've been focusing primarily on classification, where the goal is to predict one label out, out of a set of labels. In particular, we've been focusing on binary classification. The set of label contains two things, 0, 1, or minus 1, 1, or 2 or false. And the goal is to predict one of them. Today's lecture is about regression, where the goal is to predict a real number. And um, I want you to kind of keep that distinction in mind. I've noticed that sometimes when, uh, because this class throws a lot of content at you, somewhere along the way, things get confused and uh, you start thinking of using uh, a, a perceptron or something for a regression problem or something like mean squares for a classification problem. Uh, regression is when you are predicting real numbers. So uh, the plan for today is I'm going to go over one or two examples of uh, like a toy example of uh, regression and then talk about uh, the goal of learning for least mean squares, what's called the LMS, least mean squares objective. Then I'll talk about how we can optimize that objective using a method called gradient descent, which some of you are already probably familiar with. If not, we'll see today. And then I'll talk about why gradient descent may not be ideal for this case, and then introduce an idea called that used to be called incremental gradient descent, but these days a more popular name is stochastic gradient descent, and that will take us to the end of the lecture. Let's start with some examples. Imagine that you have this problem of predicting the mileage of a car. Um, and for some reason, rather than actually taking measurements, you want to predict it using, uh, you know, rather than taking measurements about the actual mileage, you want to just predict it using the weight of the car and its age. Now, I can tell you it's not a great way of doing things, but it fits on the slide, so it makes a great example. Um, so I went out and collected some data. This is kind of close to real data that I pulled up from some car website a while back. And uh, you have two features, weight and age. And for each of these, I can uh, pull up the mileage. Now, the goal is given a new car, well, not a new car, a car that we have not seen before, uh, whose weight we know and whose age we know, our goal is to predict its mileage. In other words, what we want is a function that takes two inputs, x1 and x2, or a vector of two dimensions, to predict a real number. The mileage is a real number. I mean, it's a positive number. Let's not worry about predicting negatives. Hopefully, that won't happen. So, what this means is we need to, when we think, when we, when we are faced with this sort of a new prediction problem, one of the first questions we should think about is what kind of functions can I is my learning algorithm going to search over? What we know is whatever that function might be, it should produce a real number, right? And then we can make uh, an assumption about the hypothesis space. A popular assumption for uh, prediction problems of this kind, and definitely one of the first sort of predict uh, regression uh, uh, regressors that you should try is the linear regressor. What that means is we want to predict the value that we, we care about, in this case, mileage. We, we want to model it as if it were a linear function of the input features. So the assumption in this mileage case is uh, we have two features, x1 and x2, and we are assigning weights for each one of those, w1 to x1, w2 to x2, adding a bias term for w0. And the goal of learning is to find the best possible uh, value of W. W here in bold is a vector consisting of three elements. However, we do this learning. Once we learn it, 
we can go around making predictions for new uh, inputs. So given a, uh, uh, an instance defined by this pair, x1, x2, I can make a prediction by just exactly applying this expression. Here, uh, the weights are, again, the parameters of the model, it's the weight, uh, the weight vector that we've been seeing for in, in a different context. We've been seeing weight vectors for conceptron. We've been seeing weight vectors for linear classifiers. Here, we are predicting the, uh, the real number using a weight vector that where you take a dot product of weights and features. More abstractly, your inputs for the linear regression problem consists of features, which are real numbers. So I'm going to, as always, I'm using uh, bold letters for vectors. So I have an input vector that's X, that's a d-dimensional uh, uh, input feature vector. And your outputs are real numbers. And this is the change. Your outputs are real numbers. Why? These are in R. We have a training set because we're still operating in the supervised setting. Our training set consists of pairs of X and Y that have been collected before, like rows of this table. And our goal uh, uh, for training is to approximate the Y as W1 plus W2 X2 plus W3 X3, uh, where each of these is a feature. I'm assuming that your X looks like this. Without loss of generality, I'm assuming that the first feature is one, and that's basically your bias feature. This is what I've done for other uh, the uh, linear classifiers also. This quantity here, this feature here is always one. Just makes the notation easier. You don't have to carry around a bias term. So my final prediction Y is simply the dot product of the weight vector with the, the feature where W is the learned weight vector. Questions before we... Um, Move on to anything else. Any questions about this? Yes. How? What's a good breakpoint? Well, I can always, if you, let's say you pick the breakpoint at 17. I can always move that 17 into W1. Right, I can, you know, so does it make sense? I can move that 17, I can subtract 17 from both sides and I, the breakpoint becomes zero. So I can always threshold at zero. But thresholding at zero is literally the sign. Sign of W transpose X is how linear classifiers are defined because of that reason. And uh, we wouldn't want to do exactly that. So the question was, so that, that's basically just in terms of the functional form. But we wouldn't want to use the idea of a linear regressor to build a linear classifier simply because uh, when the, the, the objective of learning is different. For a, linear, for a binary classifier, the objective is to predict a plus one or a minus one. Here, I want to get the value, the score, correct. If the mileage is 43, I can't be happy and say, oh, you know, I got 12, must be right. They are both positive. Right, so I want a prediction. So the, the 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 goal here is to get as close to the real number as possible. Whereas for classification, if I threshold, then twelve and forty three and five hundred and five million are basically all positive, so we don't care. So if imagine the car, mileage of a car is forty three, and my linear classifier predicts my, my scoring function predicts five million, the mileage of my car is five million. It gives five million miles to a gallon. Probably not a good prediction. But they are both positive, so you know that, that that's the thing. You can't use uh, one for the other simply because their goals are different. Something else I wanted to mention here is uh, I'm making an assumption that the the observed output y is a linear function of the input. There is no reason for that to be real. You know, there's no reason, for example, for the mileage of a car to be a linear function of its age and weight. Nature does not need to operate that way. So why is this a reasonable assumption? Why might I, what might justify um, my making this assumption here? Yes.
Okay, so you're saying there is a certain smoothness to it. So it's not going to be a discrete jump across. So what you have given is a justification for the function being continuous, which is fantastic. But why? I could think of different kinds of continuous functions. So this is a continuous function, a line, and so is this. Why might I prefer? Okay, that looks so terrible. So let's pick something else. Why might I prefer? Uh, let's call this thing A and this thing B. Why might I prefer A over B? Yes. We hope that nature is simple. Sometimes and often it's not. And in this case, in that case, we need to figure out what else to do. The important thing to note here is it's an assumption. We are making an assumption that nature behaves according to our model. Nature does not know about our model. Nature does not know about the fact that we are trying to find the mileage of a car as a function of its weight and um, whatever else that I pick. So nature does not have to behave in that fashion. Um, on the other hand, it's a good first step to try. And if it works or works well enough, then you're done. If it does not, then you actually get some signal as to how it fails. And that might allow you to refine things and kind of uh, it maybe change your features, for example. So it's always a good first strategy to try out the simplest thing first. Um, what does linear regression look like? It's, so in one dimension, it's very easy to plot. Imagine that you have only one feature, just x1 or whatever, x. And you observe some data points for y that look like this. What linear regression does is something that many of you probably already seen. It's uh, basically guessing a line that best approximates these points. So I might say that, you know, the, I am predicting for a point that was never seen here, the value is that much. So, uh, so you have one feature and two weights. But I could choose other functions. I could have chosen you know, a curve that uh, like this thing here, where for the same point, instead of predicting this value, I would be predicting a little more. It's another uh, uh, hypothesis choice. In three dimensions, of course, uh, I can't plot it on the screen. I can show you a projection. And uh, in three dimensions, you the, the linear regressor is trying to find a plane that best approximates a collection of points. In D dimensions, the linear regressor is trying to find a hyperplane, but unlike for classification where the hyperplane divides the space into two parts, and we say one side is negative and one side is positive, here the hyper the, the position on the hyperplane is the value. The, in this case, the position on the line is the value. Question. Mm -hmm. I don't think Yes and no. I'll tell you why. So first of all, uh, oh, there's a comment on uh, Zoom about some car being amazing. I think that's the one with the 5 million miles per gallon. This is an amazing car. Um, uh, the, the, the question was, is there ever a situation where we want to bring back the noise onto the um, uh, predictions so, so that we have maybe think about a normal distribution around this point? So Maybe if my prediction is here, I can have a normal distribution around this where you know, it can be this between these two, somewhere between these two. And we will see this when we get back, when we get to uh, Bayesian learning. It turns out everything that I'm doing today can be derived from a probabilistic point of view with exactly that assumption. Assuming that labels, the, point, the values are generated are drawn from a normal distribution around the center and find the mean and the standard deviation of that distribution. And the amazing thing is doing that will get us back to exactly where we are. So these are, you know, what I'm showing you now is one origin story for least mean square regression. You can approach the same pl uh, place from starting from a Bayesian perspective and you'll get the same thing and you'll, you can justify it from a probabilistic point of view, turns out. Um, one, uh, so the, you know, the history of least mean squares is actually fascinating. Um, 
or, or least squares regression itself. And it was used, it was invented, I think, um, around 1700s or something like that by mathematicians uh, who you're probably familiar with. Uh, I think it was Legendre, maybe Gauss was involved. Um, and it was used for uh, reconciling observations in astronomy, for example. And in, in some sense, this was used to discover laws of physics. Because you, know, you, you see some observation, you see some, uh, some celestial body shows up somewhere on such and such date and such and such uh, uh, location and such things. And you try to guess what's the, uh, how can I, can I discover a physical law? And uh, it turns out it linear regression may not work, but with appropriate changes in the features, it's going to be fine with polynomials. I, 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 there's a nice uh, uh, historical uh, note about this. I'll post a link about that somewhere on, uh, on, uh, on the class website for this thing. Anyway, the goal now is um, to find these uh, weights that best fit the data. But how do I know which weight vector best fits the training set? There are an infinite number of weight vectors. My goal is to find that one weight vector which defines a line or a plane or a hyperplane that, def that uh, characterizes all the labels perfectly. One way of going about that is rather than thinking about what is the best weight vector, let's think about what makes a weight vector bad? What makes a set of parameters bad for one example? Suppose I have an example xi and yi in the training set. I could ask, what is the, suppose my current weight vector had been w. Let's say I'm entertaining the possibility that w is the true weight vector that produces this data. I could ask if had W been the true weight vector, what would its error have been on this particular example? The prediction is W transpose X, right? It's the way we make predictions and the ground truth is Y. A natural way to measure error for real numbers is just to take the difference between them. So if your prediction is 43 and the ground truth is 21, the difference is 22. On the other hand, if your prediction is 43, oh, it's minus 22. Uh, if your prediction is 43 and the, uh, no, let's say it is, it doesn't matter, the sign is not going to matter. Let's say your prediction is, uh, so you have over predicted by 22. On the other hand, if you are ground truth was 21 and you predict say 12, you have under predicted by nine, so it's minus nine. Now, what we would like is both sides of mistakes are wrong. Over predicting, going beyond 21 is as bad as going below 21. What I want is to narrow it down from both sides. So a natural thing to do that is to take the absolute value. Predicting nine above or predicting nine below is both equally bad. So I can define something called the cost of a mistake as the absolute value of the ground truth minus the prediction. Now, suppose I have, this is for one training example. So I can, this, what I've done here is what is the cost of mistake that uh, for, for my weight vector on that one training example? I can't use just one training example to define my errors. I could also define a, a cost of, predicting to be the total cost on an entire training set. So I essentially add up the costs over all the training examples. One thing I have done here is I have gone here from absolute value to the square. Why? Because if it's a square, I can actually take derivatives and work with it more easily. Calculus becomes a little bit easier. And the square still has the property that positive and negative on centered around the actual value are both equally bad. So this expression here um, is simply the total of all the errors that are made by a particular weight vector on the entire training set. I'm multiplying by half because I'm going to take a derivative very soon and the, the, gray, the derivative of square will give you a two and you can cancel that out. 
But this is, I'm calling this expression J of W, it's just an ex a function of the weight vector and the training set. I'm, I'm hiding the training set here. It's an expression, it's a, it's a function of just the training set. And I can think of this J of W as the penalty that we have to pay if we pick W as the R model. The penalty that we pay on uh, for this training set because we chose W as our, our model. And now a natural thing to do would be to find the weight vector that has the lowest penalty. So any questions about this? So a natural thing to do here is find the weight vector that has the least cost on the training data. Now, this is our first sort of, inter, uh, um, um, you know, first time we are visiting an idea that turns out to be remarkably productive. And in some sense, it shows up again and again, and it's like the basis of a lot of things in modern machine learning. Anytime we have a learning problem, one strategy for learning could be, I define some notion of an error. I define that error in a fashion that is differentiable and it becomes, uh, we'll see in a minute why di differentiable uh, in, you know, in the, uh, in the calculus sense is important. And then I define my total cost of any classifier or regressor over the entire training set. And my goal of learning is to find the parameters with the least cost. I'm applying that idea here for regression for least mean for um, linear regression, but you can apply that for other things also, as we will see again and again. But uh, I've noticed that people, when they first encounter this idea, it seems rather easy, but then when you go home, suddenly it seems very cloudy. So I want you to kind of imagine problems with this, or imagine uh, how you would, uh, you know, kind of convince yourself that you understand it before we move ahead. Yes. Why is there this half here? Because eventually when I take the uh, derivative of J, because this square will bring a two and those two will cancel out. Now, I could have defined this without the half and that will not change. Let's say there was one weight factor that has the lowest uh, error without the half. It will also have the lowest error with the half because half is a positive number. Multi, it's not going to change the thing. And um, having that half is going to make life a little bit easier when we do our calculus so that we don't accidentally forget to copy one half every time or two. Uh, it's mostly there so that we don't make mistakes later. Other questions? Or any questions? Yes. What if we don't want to do the line in the middle? What we want to make it in the line? Not the over predicting the model and how they can predict it. Then you have to change the loss to account for that. So what you're doing then is uh, um, so you can't really you, you can't say that you know the uh, let's say you have this thing here. This is the ground truth. Let's say predicting a nine for eleven is much worse than predicting a 13, for example, then you need to consider one side and assign an extra weight. And then you have to do, basically you have to invent a new loss. Uh, it's going to get a little ugly. Um, and maybe that's a good exam question. Um, or maybe a good homework question, but yes, uh, it, it tends to get a bit ugly when you go slightly beyond what is the standard library, uh, but that's where the fun is. Other thoughts, other questions? By the way, if you want to kind of think about how that might work, um, goes back to the point that came up about, can you put a Gaussian around this? What this is doing is basically putting a Gaussian centered here. I can imagine a different distribution that's tilted one way or another and derive the whole thing from there. I'm not giving you a, a full answer here because 
that will require me to explain the Bayesian approach. And basically then I don't know what I would do at the end of the semester. Uh, so let's not jump ahead yet. Okay. Um, what we have here is uh, the fundamental idea behind least mean square regression. The goal of learning is to minimize, meaning find among all weight vectors, the one that has the minimum value of this expression. This expression, I call it the mean squared error. This quantity is a squared error here. There must be no controversy about that because I'm taking the square of an error. Sometimes people get upset that I'm calling this thing a mean because I'm just adding it up. Um, if it makes you better, you can put a one over two M here so that you're dividing everything by the number of examples. But M is a positive number and again, same idea. I'll forget to you know, carry it around when I'm doing the math, so might as well just get rid of it. It's the least squared error. Um, that's why th th this is one of those learning strategies where the name of the approach essentially gives you the entire uh, gives the entire story away. So least mean squared error. So I have squared error. I'm taking the mean of the squared error. I'm minimizing it, and that gives you the regression uh, strategy. This is our first uh, uh, first time we are visiting this idea of. Uh, framing learning as an optimization problem. Learning as optimization, as I said before, is an incredibly productive and one of the most widely used strategies to the point where certain machine learning courses essentially start with that idea right? by saying, okay, now we can frame learning as optimization and let's build the entire edifice of machine learning from that. Um, most modern machine learning, like if you've heard of things like uh, libraries like PyTorch or TensorFlow, or JAX, they are essentially fancy optimization libraries for setting up learning as optimization. So you can, you know, they, they do a lot of the heavy lifting for optimization for you. You can just treat it as a numerical optimization library if you want. There are many different strategies for learning by optimization. Um, the most popular one involves using the gradient of the objective function. The expression that we are optimizing is called the objective function. Um, it turns out that for this particular objective function that I've shown here, you don't need to do learning as optimization. Well, you don't need to do, you don't need a learning algorithm. There is a closed form solution. You can actually derive the solution to this problem on paper without having any help from a computer and just compute the answer. I mean, you'll probably need a computer for computing the answer, but you can derive a closed form solution. At the end of the lecture, I'll ask you, I'll show you what the closed form solution is and kind of leave it as an exercise for you to derive it yourself. It's a good exercise for uh, kind of getting comfortable with taking derivatives of uh, uh, these sorts of functions, of vector and matrix functions. But for now, instead of uh, showing you the analytical solution, I'm going to show you an algorithmic solution where we're going to invent an algorithm that computes the, that, that essentially minimizes this function. And that's, that takes us to our, uh, the, gra the, the, the gradient descent algorithm for least mean square regression. There's a question. Yeah, so in practice, if there are different algorithms that can't come to the is there any benefit to using the algorithm that can be the algorithm? Yes. Um, there are two benefits here. The first one is sometimes the algorithmic approach need not be run to completion. You can get a solution very quickly without actually letting it run all the way through. The we will the the analytic solution, the analytical solution that we will uh, that for this particular problem involves inverting a giant matrix. And maybe sometimes it might be faster to run your algorithm for a bit for less time than it takes to invert the matrix and you'll get a reasonable solution that you can walk away with. That's one solution, one, one reason. The other reason, which I think is more important is rather than looking at this particular problem as, uh, as uh, the only thing we care about, think of this as a template for other types of regression. The analytical solution exists for linear regression and linear regression only. 
Uh, imagine that instead of linear regression, these x's themselves were parameters were the output of some other model, and you want to find both models together. Then you you can't. There is no closed form solution. So you know, the, think of what we are doing now as like a template for designing algorithmic solutions for other types of uh, other problems of this nature. But in a lot of the linear regression libraries do not do the uh, algorithmic, do not use the algorithmic solution. For linear regression, I would say we have such fantastic uh, libraries for inverting matrices that that might just be sufficient. And I'm introducing this in a different way, mostly to kind of give you this, rather than telling you, yeah, you can invert a matrix and solve the problem. Here's a recipe. And this is a recipe that we can, you can apply for other sorts of problems. The recipe here is essentially using gradient descent. And that's what we're going to do next. Gradient descent is a general strategy for minimizing any function. Um, here, we, the function we are trying to minimize is, is j of w. Remember that w here is a vector. So you have a vector. And for every value of w, you get a real number. And um, it's very hard. It might be hard to visualize uh, this idea of a function that is operating on a vector space. So what I like to do is uh, uh, to think about uh, a two-dimensional surface and imagine that there's like a almost like a mountain type thing, mountain range on top of that surface. So the height of the point at any point in the in the on the surface is the value that of the function and our goal is to get to the lowest value possible that's the mental sort of uh, 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 analogy that i like to kind of keep in mind while thinking about it. gradient descent is a general strategy for minimizing or maximize well gradient descent is for minimizing gradient ascent is for maximizing functions um, the way it works is um, we want you start off with an initial guess the initial guess could be something that w0. w0 is a point on the surface. It's a weight vector. Our goal is to find a single weight vector. And then we ask, at the point that we are currently standing, what is the gradient of the function, um, uh, the, the function that we want to optimize, this function here or whatever function we have? Now, the intuition is that the gradient of a function, what is the gradient of a function? The gradient of the function is the direction in which the function grows the fastest. Our goal is to minimize the function so it makes sense to take a step in the opposite direction. If the function is growing the fastest in, on one side, you take a step in the opposite direction. Imagine that you're trying to get to the bottom of a valley and you're standing somewhere on the mountain and let's say there's fog everywhere. You can't see far away. Where you are, you can kind of feel around and get a sense of which side is going up locally. And if it's going up on one side, you take a step in the exact opposite side. And that takes you to a new point from W0 takes you to W1. W1, because you took a step away from the direction in which the function grows the fastest, W1 might take you to a better place. What is better? It's lower in this objective value. So you do now you're in, in a new uh, location. You have a better, you have a new guess for the weight, for the parameters that you care about. And we can do the same thing. We can examine the gradient of the function around where we are. And remember that the gradient again is the direction in which the function grows the steepest, grows the fastest. And you take a step in the direction exactly opposite to that. So you keep doing this until you get to a point where you're basically done. The function is not growing too much in any direction, so you can't really take a step in any direction, and you're you call it done. So you keep going. Eventually, you know you go from w zero to w one to w two to w three, and as you proceed against the gradient, you're getting to a point where the function is decreasing. This is just an intuitive. Uh, idea for gradient descent. Have people seen gradient descent before? Most people have. So I need not have spent all this time. 
No, it's good. That's it's always good to see this a few times. Let's see a, a version of gradient descent for least mean square regression. Um, it's basically an alg algorithm that does what I just described. You initialize your weights to some weight vector uh, W0, and then you keep iterating. At each step, we compute the gradient of the objective function. And I see that uh, my rent, there's an error here. Uh, this should be nabla j of wt. I'm, call, I'm, I'm calling it, uh, I'm just uh, giving the, it this name. The, what is the type of a gradient is the, uh, of a function? So if j of w produces, so what, first of all, what's the type of this function here? This What's the type of this value? Is it a number? Is it a vector matrix? Value. What's the value? I mean, what's the type of that value? It's a number. So J of W gives you a number. Why? Because it's a sum of differences of uh, a number and another number. So you have a number. What's the type of W? W is a vector. What's the type of the gradient of J? Can someone else answer this question? It's a vector. So this is something that's a good sanity check. If your gradient is not a vector, then there's something wrong. In general, if you have a function f that has some argument, let's call that v, the type of the gradient of this function is exactly the same as the type of v itself. That's a good sort of a sanity check because uh, that's otherwise you can't apply this kind of an, uh, an update. So you compute the gradient and then you apply an update. The update is simply, I take a step in the opposite direction of the gradient. And how big is my step? My step size is going to be R. R is called the learning rate, just like we saw with perceptron. And for now, let's pretend that R is just a small constant, just like we did with perceptron. We'll get back to that later. Any questions about this? Any questions about this high level strategy for learning? Yes. Can you just refer them? Ah, you can't tell. It's, it's, okay, so the question was can I plot on a graph both a function and its gradient? Let me see if I can do that for some simple functions. So imagine that, let's pretend that we have two dimensions. So imagine that my function is um, see I for this I need to draw a function. Let's say I have x one and x two. So let's say f of x one comma x two is x one square plus x two square. This is going to be like the set of level curves that are going around. The gradient of this is. 2x1 and 2x2. So for every point, so at this point here, no. At this point, oh man, at this point here, it's a, I, I should not have done a function in three dimensions because now I need to draw a plane. Um, let's just make it 2D. So imagine that my function f of x, this is y, is x squared. So I have, wow, that's the worst parabola ever. I can't draw parabola. So let's pretend this is correct. Now the derivative of this is 2x, which is simply this line. For So I have shown you a function and its gradient. You don't look happy, so I don't know what to say. It's, a, it's not a number. It's a the gradient itself is a function. For any point here, I can compute its gradient. It's a it's a number at that point, but in general, it's a function. Okay. Um, the real problem with this is this seems like a simple algorithm. All I have to do is compute the gradient, take a step, compute the gradient, take a step, 
keep going till I run out of time. The tricky part here is really not uh, implementing this algorithm, but computing the gradient of a function. So this again is a mistake. This should be, what is the gradient of that function j at any point um, uh, wt? That's what we're going to do next. So the gradient, as I said, itself is a vector uh, that has, if your original input, if your weights have d dimensions, the gradient itself should have d dimensions because you're taking the partial derivative of the function with respect to every one of the weights. So your weight has d elements. So what I can do is now compute, ask what's the partial derivative of this j with respect to w, with respect to the jth element, with respect to this particular weight passing, weight element. I can compute that, right? I mean, that's just taking that's your intro to calculus. So I'm going to just go through this one step at a time. I'm taking the partial derivative of j, but that's really partial derivative of this function here, um, of half of the sum of the squared differences. But uh, the derivative of a sum is simply the sum of derivatives. So I can move, this, move the, the, uh, the, the derivative operator inside, the partial derivative inside. I know what the, this is simply something squared. The derivative of something squared is two times xi times the gradient, the derivative of wj with of, of the thing inside the bracket. Right, so I could do that, but this thing here is exactly the same. I've just expanded the dot product out and uh, just written it in a little too much detail, Mo mostly to note that everything here, the, nothing here depends on wj except for this jth element here. If a dot product, only the jth element of the dot product depends on wj. So if the gradient of all of these things with respect to WJ zeroes out. So all of these things will get canceled. And the only thing that's left is the negative of the XIJ. Why negative? Because I have negatives here. Um, and to answer the question that came up, why did I have a two? Uh, why did I have this half? Because when I took the... Um, gradient of the of this quantity here i have two times that so that gets yeah i can cancel that out and cleaning everything up i get an expression that simply the sum over all the examples the negative of y minus w transpose x times xij the for the ith example the jth feature value this is just one element of that vector so i compute i do this as many times as I have features, so I have d features, I do this d times. In practice, I don't do this d times. In practice, I will do this. Well, I have to do this d times, but I have to do this and I can do this in parallel because all of these are independent. In practice, I can do this using libraries that can do gradient uh, computation for me. You won't be doing that because then what's the fun of implementing from scratch? Um, you will be implementing something like this from scratch for some homework. So this is just one element of the weight vector, I, I, and I get, uh, uh, you know, I do this d times, I get d uh, gradients. And just as a uh, way to interpret this, in this one case, I have a nice interpretation where the uh, gradient of j with respect to, of the objective with respect to the, the weight vector is simply the weighted sum of all the errors. And what is the weight? The weight is simply the jth component of that particular, of each example. Any questions about this? I mean, th this is, I have told you multiple times, this is the worst way to learn math. Um, you have to do this on your own. I mean, I can show you what's there, but I mean, it's really boring to see someone else just flip through math on slides. So I encourage you to kind of work it out on your own. Um, you can quickly even try to do this on paper if you have a paper handy now, just to see if you can make sense of it. Any questions? Now you think this is tedious, 
imagine that this function here was much more complicated. Imagine that you have a really complicated function that uh, does not uh, admit this sort of a nice one slide computation of gradients. And you have to essentially implement an algorithm that computes your gradients for you. Fortunately, there exists such an algorithm that computes your gradients for you. That's called back propagation. You may have heard of back propagation. Back propagation is simply an algorithm that does your calculus for you. But we will not do back propagation right now. We'll do it like uh, in the last third of the semester, but just to kind of uh, seed the thought. If this is tedious, don't worry. There's an algorithm that does it for you. So what we have here is for, uh, we can, you know, we have a way of computing the gradient and I just uh, derived this expression that could be the gradient of uh, each weight element um, with respect to the current weight vector. And this is one element of your gradient. And then I update the weights. Um, this here is vector subtraction. I update the weights by taking a step away from this gradient. This is the direction in which the function grows the fastest. So I take a step in the opposite direction. How long do I do this? I do this as long as the error reaches some threshold. If my squared error is less than some value, I would call it as done. So you have some stopping condition. This is called a stopping condition. Or you do this for as long as your uh, patient allows. Maybe you do it for 20 uh, uh, iterations or maybe 200 iterations. One way or another, at some finite point, you stop and that'll be your final weight factor. So this is essentially the entirety of gradient descent for least mean square regression. And one of the nice properties about this particular algorithm is that it is guaranteed to converge um, if R is small enough. If small enough can just be like, you know, 0.1. It doesn't, you don't have to think too hard. This algorithm is guaranteed to converge. And the reason for that is because the objective function that we are optimizing has a fantastic property that it's a convex function. Quick show of hand, how many people have encountered convex functions before? Many of you, and some of you have not. Uh, that's fine. Convex functions, um, I'm not gonna introduce convexity uh, from scratch, but basically convex functions are functions that look like a cup. And what you have here is you have this, uh, the, the, the metaphor is you have a ball rolling down this thing. And if it's a convex function, you're guaranteed to get to the bottom. An example of a function that's not convex might be something like that looks like this. If your ball starts rolling here, you can keep going down to infinity, but you will never, you can't get to the top of the head. Another function that's not convex is, depending on where you start, you can end at a different place. So if you start in this area, you end up here. If you start here, you end up here. It just so happens that the function j that we have looks like this thing where there's exactly one valley and no matter where you start, you'll get to the smallest place. So that's fantastic. So the means linear regression has that property. Questions, questions about the algorithm, questions about uh, convexity, questions about imagine implementing this and how would you do this? Yeah. Uh, could you find the maximum of, of a function by inverting? That's exactly how you do it. You just make it a negative. Mm -hmm. And um, that's basically it. Or you could do it in a different way. Uh, instead of taking a step, remember, the gradient is the direction in which the function grows the fastest. So you can take a step in the direction of the gradient rather than taking a step in the opposite direction. So that's called gradient ascent which is exactly the same as inverting the function. And inverting means negating, not divide one over that. Right? Yeah. Okay, um, either all of you are experts on this and I've just been going slow for no reason, or you are completely stupefied and don't want to ask questions. Um, I really hope it's not the latter, uh, but last chance for questions. There's a question on, ah, there's a question on Zoom. Do all error functions need to be convex? 
Um, this is a uh, not really, no, they don't need to be convex. I can invent an error function that's complicated and has this, this sort of a wiggly shape and depending on where you start, you can end up in a different place. In fact, neural networks beyond any neural network that's not the simplest kind has that property. For the longest time in machine learning, when I, uh, the, the, the dominant thought was to find convex uh, objectives to optimize. It's only in the last decade where it became sort of um, accepted widely that it's okay if your ob objective function is not convex because then you can start many times and find the place that's the, find the value that's the lowest. Um, most advances in machine learning that you probably heard of in the last decade don't use convex functions. Um, convexity is, a, is like one of these, uh, if you are familiar with the expression, a spherical cow. Uh, it's an assumption that you make about nature that does not necessarily hold, uh, but it makes analysis and uh, algorithms convenient. So we kind of try to find the best approximation that is convex. In practice today, most error functions are not convex, um, simply because the models that we build are not convex. Other questions? Yes. What is the... Yeah, so uh, the question slash comment was, that's the real reason why we have a decaying learning rate. And you didn't say what the, that was, but I'm going to, uh, I think I know what you're talking about. Um, among, among other reasons, you could, for instance, imagine that your step size, you're taking tiny steps, you're going from here to here to here. But imagine your step size was massive. Then you go from here to here directly, and then you go here, and then you keep, you can diverge. So small learning rates prevent you from di uh, diverging and a decaying learning rate will mean that even when you, as you get closer to the bottom, you take smaller and smaller steps. So you are essentially staying in that area. Uh, you first and then you, yes. Why shouldn't you consider absolute value? You can, you can consider absolute value and uh, it's just gonna make your gradient a little bit interesting because the absolute value function, if you plot it, looks something like a V. At this point, this function is not differentiable. Um, turns out there exist ideas to get around it. Uh, historically, this is the one that people use because we want smooth functions. But you can consider absolute value, your gradient will change. The definition of your gradient will change. And in fact, if you're interested, think about it. Yeah, it, it should, it'll have very similar properties. In fact, uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, you can derive gradient, uh, the, the least mean square regression from a probabilistic point of view. Turns out the absolute value has a different probabilistic interpretation. Your errors are not Gaussian, but uh, come from a Laplace distribution. Just a different uh, assumption takes you to the same, uh, to a, different cost function. This one's a little bit trickier to optimize, but not so much. Um, intuitively, what the, the, the squared loss does is it penalizes bigger mistakes more, and it penalizes smaller mistakes less. Because imagine that the error is 0 0.1. 0 0.1 squared is, a very, is smaller than 0.1. So it been less. So if your error is less than one, squaring that will give you a number that's smaller. So it penalizes small mistakes less and big mistakes more. Whereas, uh, not always. It depends on some assumptions that you have to make. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to um, get uh, like some more information from you. So for Non for non convex functions, right? We could do like KKT or there are a bunch of other things we could do. What are people in this field so, uh, do to, to, to optimize these non convex functions? So the KKT conditions are only defined for convex functions. 
They're refined for Lipschitz continuous. Lipschitz continuous. Yeah, not good. Um, they, they do have a spectrum form. Spectrum. Yeah, but the convex form is the one that really works. Um, sure. You can still do it with non convex. You can do That's the thing. Point. You can apply your standard approaches for non convex. You don't get the guarantees anymore. That's, 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 that's what I want to be a comment. So that's one way of doing it. Like what if people in practice, people just do gradient based optimization. Okay. Simply because the computational machinery for gradient based optimization is can be made so efficient that uh, it far outweighs other things. So, like, do, do, do like simulated at all? It is, but uh, not with pride. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I just think like, uh, do, do they do like, uh, did you do any kind of like triplication development like envelopes in the function and stuff like that? People try have tried a lot of things where you try to develop and develop convex approximations of functions. Yeah. Um, and that there used to be this sort of a very, very technical and very, very uh, sort of interesting cottage industry around that. Mm -hmm. The lesson from the last 10 years is don't think too hard, just give it to an optimizer and it will be fine. I just think that's like really simple sometimes, like especially if you get like all the things on your initialization. Yes, it, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And if you initialize that, then you are out of luck. Then, yep, yeah. yeah. Uh, but you know, let's move the discussion to when we come to neural networks okay. because that's going to be an important point. Okay. Um, uh, uh, do you mind if I go ahead or short, small question? I was just wondering, based on question, what do we can look at the data? What was the state of the model? We'll, we'll get to that later. Yes. Because I want to talk about something that's closer to what's actually applied, which is an idea called incremental or so more recently and more commonly stochastic gradient descent. Now, notice that in, the, in, in when I derive this gradient, the gradient expression uh, involved to compute the, this summation here, to compute the gradient of uh, this weight vector. For every element of the weight vector, for the jth element and for every element here, uh, I need to sum over the entire data set. So I need to do a pass over the entire data set once, and then I get one update. So the weight vector cannot be updated until you have essentially touched each example once and computed this value here. So, but let's say that the first example you touch, gives you an error that's massive, really big. You know that your weight vector is lousy. Why can't, so the, the, the question is, can you just make early updates as soon as you may see an example, rather than doing a pass over the entire data set, accumulating all the gradients over you know, the indi individual examples, and then letting that uh, uh, give you the full update. So can you make these early updates as soon as you see an example, compute its gradient, so essentially the thing inside the summation, make the update right away, and then move back, move to the next example, rather than iterating over all the examples, then making the update. This is the intuition that uh, led to this uh, idea called the incremental uh, or stochastic gradient descent, um, where we uh, the, the general uh, recipe for this algorithm is the following. You pick an example. You pick one example from the training set, X i y i. You pretend that they, you don't have any other examples. The entire training set is just this one example. And you can compute the gradient of that one example. Use that example to calculate the gradient um, and then uh, make an update. Put that example back in the pot. Now pick another example. Or pick, pick an example again from the, the set of examples. Pretend that that example is not the only example out there. Compute the gradient, make an update, put it back in the set of examples. Keep doing this till you're happy. In contrast, what we saw before is called the batch gradient descent. The batch gradient descent makes one update after seeing all the examples, incremental or stochastic. I'll, I'll just be saying stochastic gradient descent from now on. Stochastic gradient descent makes a, an update after seeing a single example. In practice, it might look something like this. Uh, rather than pick a random example and make an update, you can essentially iterate over the entire training data. So you first, you have this loop over epochs, just like we saw with the batch perceptron. 
and then we have we iterate over each training example. For every training example, we update that example by pretending that that's the uh, only uh, example we have. So you can compute the gradient, and I'll leave it as an exercise. But if you go through the process of computing the gradient from before, you should get exactly this expression. There's no summation here. And then you take a step in the opposite direction to this recently computed gradient. And then that's it. That's the entirety of the algorithm. And then at the end, you have three return W. So you keep doing this again and again till some threshold uh, for the error is uh, uh, met. In contrast, in the previous case, you would not update the W after, after seeing each example. This update would be somewhere outside. So you first, instead of updating W here, you first accumulate all the gradients and then have a single update. The advantage of this approach is that you kind of can make early updates to your weights after having seen the first few examples already. If your first initial examples are bad, you already make some updates rather than using that bad weight vector to compute a gradient over the entire data set. Now, this algorithm, it turns out, is really, really, really old. In the neural network literature, this may have been the one of the first algorithms that was ever invented for neural networks. It's also called the Widrow Hoff uh, uh, update rule for linear regression. Uh, I don't know if anyone calls it that anymore because this is so common that it doesn't, it, the name has kind of disappeared. But in case somebody asks, now you know the Widrow Hoff rule. Questions? Yes. So the idea is that no, no, you, you don't, you just update no matter whether it's far off or not. Because if it were not bad, then the update would be small. So it doesn't matter. The idea is you first loop over all the examples. For every example, you compute the gradient of the current weight and you update the weight. Then for the next example, you use the updated weight, compute the gradient update the weight again. For the next example, you use the newly updated weights, compute the gradient, update the weight again. And that's it. Uh, you've asked questions before, so I'll go. You also asked questions before. I don't know, you, I saw your hand first. Sometimes uh, this is also, if you, yeah, it's, it feels like an online algorithm, but it's not because you are looping over the same data set again and again. But it can be, it has a flavor of being online. You're right. Yes, yes, that's right. And in practice, I'm going to assume that you're doing this on a batch because it just, that's how things work. That's how it's usually deployed. What? Oh, oh uh, no, no. In fact, oh, I see. So I'm I'm using the word batch in two different ways. Um, the gradient. Let's use the gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent. Gradient descent is for least mean square regression is hardly ever used. Stochastic or incremental gradient descent is what is all universally used. If you are using something that's not analytical. Um, and the stochastic slash incremental algorithm feels like an online algorithm because you see an example, you make an update, and you kind of toss it out. So it does have that flavor. Yes. And I think I, if I remember, if memory serves me right, the original Widrow Hoff update actually was presented as an online uh, type algorithm. Yes. Um, this is a slightly different question, but I guess I don't want to get into that. It's a it's a very tiny detail that doesn't really matter. In practice, there has to be randomness here. Just like with your perceptron where you shuffled all the data right here, you have to do that here also. The last thing I want to say is this is the one that's typically used. And it often tends to get to the optimum much faster in terms of time than the batch algorithm because it just gets there uh, sooner. Okay, um, I wanted to finish this entire unit today, but I'm, I have maybe a few minutes and I'll pick that up uh, 
uh, on Thursday. Don't forget your homework. Don't forget to do the project milestone. And I'll see you on Thursday.